tonight to tonight's GCPL Meet the Author uh, event with Rick Bragg. I'm Denise Sozier, the Adult Programming Manager for the Gwinnett County Public Library. And this program is being recorded for you and will be available on our YouTube channel mid-December. Later on this evening, inside of the Q&A box, I will write the address for you so that you can jot it down if you want to watch the completed video. My bookstore partner tonight is Eagle Eye Bookshop, um, and they have copies, a few left, just a few, I understand, that have limited edition signed book plates in them. So you'd best call them or get on their website during this program and buy those books because it is a limited number of them. Um, you can visit their website by doing that, and I'm going to type their website into the Q&A box also for you. Um, while uh, Duffy is talking with Rick, and then she will, she will talk to him for a little while, and then she'll open it up for your questions. You're not going to type those in the chat box the way you would with, say, Google Meet. Or if you put your cursor around the bottom of the page, you'll see that there's a Q&A box, and that's where you're going to write your questions for Duffy to, to give to Rick. We hope that you'll join us in the next couple of weeks with chef and cookbook author Tara Teaspoon Bench, uh, Elizabeth Musser, and veterinarian and dog food uh, advocate, um, Dr. Oscar Chavez, who takes on big kibble. So we hope you'll join us for that. I'll type in the Q&A box where you can sign up for these events. But we'll start with our, our program tonight and our very wonderful moderator, uh, who we appreciate very much, is Duffy Dixon. And Duffy is a multi-Emmy award-winning journalist. She is founder of Duffy Dixon Media, and she now shares her communication expertise and media expertise with corporate executives, government officials, individuals, and nonprofit organizations. And as she is a big blessing to us. She is also a podcast host at Business Radio X, a member of the National Speakers Association, and a frequently sought after event MC and moderator. And we are very grateful to have her. Take it away, Duffy. I sure will. Uh, I want to say to everyone out there, I know you're jealous of me because I get to talk to Rick Bragg and I know it. Uh, this is so exciting for us. Um, Rick Bragg, of course, you should know his name because you're on of this, but he is a celebrated author. He represents us in the South. He is a newspaper columnist, a Pulitzer Prize winner. So yeah, I may have an Emmy, but he's got a Pulitzer Prize, so he totally trumps me. He is considered one of the South's favorite writers, and, uh, you know, he has to be. When Pat Conroy is singing your praises, you're a big deal. So Rick Bragg is the author of eight books, including the Pulitzer Prize winning All Over But the Shoutin' and The Best Cook in the World, which, spoiler alert, it's his mom. And so he is going to join us with his most recent book. Now, this is a compilation of a lot of things you may have seen over the years in Garden and Gun and in Southern Living. And uh, this is the stories of the Deep South. And the thing I love about this is, Rick, I don't know if you knew this, but this was the perfect read for the, for the times we're in. These stories make you laugh. They make you cry. They're quick. You can... You pick it up and put it down and um you know i'm gonna let you take it from there i want to ask you first because people may be wondering you have been through the quarantine like the rest of us what is your life like right now and you're going to address why you may freeze up on screen and there's a good reason yeah we're we're in the middle of 40 acres of, uh, of mountain pasture here uh in northeast alabama and there's a ridge line towering over one side of me and uh, we're in the middle of a forest and there is a, about a, a triangle about, oh, I would say three feet by three feet by three feet uh, where I have cell reception, uh, where I have any kind of, uh, there is no internet. So uh, I, my phone uh, has a feed that allows me to, to do this in a kind of half-assed way. Can you say half-assed on Zoom? We just you did. You can. We just did. Oh, okay. And um, 
And uh, so uh, if I go in and out, I know how frustrating that is, but it's kind of like watching me in person. Anybody that's ever seen me talk in person know I drift in and out there too. So it won't be any different from that. But yeah, we're way out here and, and uh, that's been good for COVID. The distance has has been, um, uh, you know, it's me and my my uh, eighty three year old mom. Uh, it's been good in that way, but it's also a little lonely out here. You yeah, know, I think we're all it, feeling a little of that. Yeah, so you're not yeah. alone, just you and your mother, and then you have some other animals with you, a quite quite a few animals. Yeah, we have the uh, uh, the the magical dog uh, Speck. Uh, Mama named him uh, the Speckled Beauty uh, after a cousin we had who had a million freckles. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a jackass. Uh, actually, there are three jackasses. There's a giant mule named Bella and two tiny jackasses. Uh, and there's about 40 cats, uh, which is a great embarrassment to us. Uh, my I mama just want to make it clear, me. you said 13 in an article I read. So that is that number yeah. is way off now. Yeah, that would be what we call here in uh, my corner of the Deep South, a lie. <laughs> uh, there's about 40. Um, but we're working on it. We're getting them uh, spayed and neutered and so I guess when that's all done, we'll still have 40, but at least the future will be brighter. Right. Uh, we don't even like cats. I mean, they just appeared, you know, they just showed up and my poor dog's just going crazy because he can't even lay down without laying down on a kitten. So we're, uh, yeah, it's a constant struggle around here. So you uh, obviously write a lot. I'd like to know when, at, like what time of day you write, where you write, and has this been a prolific season for you? I mean, you do have a lot of time on your hands. And, and you told me you, were, you, were, you had already started this book, uh, but how have you been spending the days as far as writing? Well, I would love to say that, that uh, the isolation has given me time to be reflective and given me time to think deep thoughts and, and ponder the duality of man and things like that. But the truth is I write when I have to. I don't like writing. I like having written. And, uh, and writing is like... A, now, don't get me wrong. Uh, sometimes I think I've got something to say, and 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 I'm lucky to have an audience to say that too. And sometimes that's serious, and sometimes it's just nostalgia. It's just, you know, a sweet memory. Uh, uh, I take both of them as seriously, but but no, I write when I have to. You know, I, I write when, you know, if you didn't give me a deadline and a, uh, and a contract, uh, well, I would just sit in the corner and, and do nothing. I am not a, I am not one of those people who will write unless they have some kind of motivation. And, um, uh, I don't believe in the muse. You know, a lot of people, you know, that, you know I've heard people say this at, at, at literary festivals. Uh, they'll say, uh, did you write yesterday? And someone else will say, well, no, I didn't. The muse wasn't on me. You know, like the muse is this like Tinkerbell that floats in through the window and lights on their shoulder and whispers words in their ear. But no, the, to, to me, the muse is, is, is a hairy, nasty little thing, like goat-like thing, like want or need. And it, you know, it stomps in and it, and it bothers you until you, until you write something down. And 
and and and I've talked so much now. I don't even remember what the question was. Well, that's but, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, so so you would be a procrastinator, uh, but you aren't because because you write when you need to, and you don't yeah. believe in a muse, and and you're just and the way you describe a muse, I don't want one either. We now have yeah. some we now have some uh, some questions coming in. So Jordan um, Shane Field asks. Well, first he says Roll Tide. Now I will not go along with that because I root for UGA. We are not going to do that here. I'll give you one woo woo. Right, now, right. listen, first of all, <laughs> Georgia people are people, too. I feel the same way about people from Alabama. Okay. <laughs> so he wants to know, are you still teaching? Yeah, I am. Uh, we have to do it mostly remotely now because of the COVID. And uh, uh, although some people would question whether that could have a yes or no answer. Uh, but I, yeah, I am. I, teaching writing is, 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 I can talk about writing. Because uh, talking about writing is a lot easier than writing. You know, huh. I, I can talk about writing all day uh, because there's no uh, pressure in talking about writing. Uh, and I love the craft of it, even though, you know, I have to be kind of prodded with a sharp stick to actually sometimes do it. But, but uh, yeah, I am teaching. I still teach at the University of Alabama, uh, uh, Roll Tide. Um, I actually have many friends and fond feelings about UGA. Um, uh, my first dean went over there and took over the uh, uh, the school of communications over there and and uh, uh, and I even pull for the for the dogs when they're not playing Alabama. Um, well, see, we yeah, you you got to pull for yeah, people I in mean, the south. <laughs> right. Although I I will admit that y'all have the most obnoxious bumper stickers of any football team anywhere on earth i'll never forget being stuck in tra and i put this in the book there's a whole story about being stuck in traffic in in uh, in atlanta and and i got stuck behind uh, a car and y'all know what it that means usually if you get stuck in traffic that's what 30 minutes or so 45 minutes but there is like the rest of my life and and I was behind a, a, a car that had a bumper sticker that said, hunker down, you hairy dogs, or something to that effect. Well, you're right. And I thought, what if I die here? I mean, what if I, because I'm. this is going to be the rest of my life, because the feeling you have in traffic in Atlanta is, this is the rest of your life. And I thought, what if I die here? And the very last thing I read, after all the wonderful books I've read, uh, uh, Mopey Dick. And, and to kill a mockingbird, uh, you know, all the Charles Dickens I've read. And the last thing in my life that I ever see is hunker down, you hairy dogs. Well, now we know what to get you on a t-shirt and a mug for Christmas. Thank you yeah, for I'll be the looking idea. For it. Yeah, yeah, I'll be looking for that. Okay, so we have another question, and you've uh, you've mentioned a few names. So add to this list. Uh, this is Sharon Purden, and she says, "Who is your favorite author?" That's almost impossible to say because if you ask me this tomorrow, uh, and I think that's the way with a lot of people, you know, uh, if you ask me this tomorrow, it'll probably change. But but the 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 writer that I see that I think I have learned the most from and the, and whose stories are just pure escape for me has been Larry McMurtry, you know, the Pulitzer Prize winning author of Lonesome Dove, but it was, and Lonesome Dove has become such a huge kind of conglomerate of, of movies and, and all that kind of thing. But, 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 but Larry McMurtry writing about Texas is uh, is just one of the most beautiful and eloquent. He his characters get up and and 
and push against you almost, you know, that, that you can almost feel that pressure. The words are, make them so real that they take on a real substance. And, and, um, and the scenes are just remarkably beautiful. You know, it does, it does take uh, you right there. Is it Telegraph Days, that one of his? The uh, Telegraph Days is one of his. The ones that I have, uh, the one that I probably quote lines from the most would be uh, uh, Last Picture Show. Yep. But, but, but Lonesome Dove is, as far as I'm concerned, is the greatest saga, you know, ever, ever told. Um, but there's, you know, then there are those moral sermons out there like to kill a mockingbird you know that stay with you and and then there's you know uh, to me you know uh i can almost quote uh a christmas carol by charles dickens front to back i you know i don't read a lot of Nietzsche. i don't read a lot of uh of finer writers that would probably improve me as a human being and maybe even as a writer. But I've read just about everything that James Lee Burke ever did. Uh, you know, um, he wrote a, 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 a line about juke joints in Louisiana and out in the country and how at night they just come ablaze. They just light up with with throbbing color and the sound of electric guitar, you know, pulsing through the walls and the, the sound and the, you know, broken glass and laughter. And then in the morning, they disappear. You know, they go gray and they almost become invisible. Well, you know, that's, that's kind of what I, uh, you know, I'm 61, so I better stop aspiring to much and, just do it, but 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 that's the kind of of poetry, the kind of imagery to tell and color that you know I think a, a writer ought to aspire to because nobody ever ever says you know I sure did love that writer he just wrote so dull. That's right. So here's another he, question. You know, he was yeah. just so dull. <laughs> he was so dull. No one. <laughs> Jean Simpson wants to know how your mom is doing. How is your mama these days, she asks. She is literally on the other side of the door. She is watching, uh, uh, it was Bonanza when I went in here. By now, it's probably Gunsmoke. She only watches uh, Westerns from the 1950s and 60s and uh, TV preachers. Uh, sometimes uh, she switches between them when I'm not paying attention and I get mildly confused. But um, I, she's doing okay. She, um, she has survived um, colon cancer. She survived a serious heart attack. She has survived more than I can say. And she is in there right now doing okay. And uh, she is, um, she's in there with my brother and sister-in-law and my niece. And tonight was pizza night. Uh, That's not so, Southern food. Yeah, no, <laughs> we, we, we go, we go just butt wild every now and then and <laughs> do something different. We've even been known to bring in some Chinese food in here, but uh, yeah, she's doing okay. That's, thank you for asking. Absolutely. Um, so uh, Beth Robinson, I think, I'm sorry, Rudiman, uh, wants to know, tell us about your latest book. What do we get next? Well, the, you know, the collection uh, uh, was, uh, you know, we were talking about how it was, maybe it was a good book for now. This collection is probably a good book for now. But next year, next fall, one year from we're in November. In October of next year, we'll have a book out called The Speckled Beauty. And it's a, it's a, uh, well, let's just say I'm like every other Southern writer that's ever done this for a living. I've always wanted to write a book about a dog. 
<laughs> and I have intellectual friends who scoff at me and say, don't, don't be that, don't do that. Don't be one more Southern writer right now. But about, um, oh, I guess three years ago, I found an Australian shepherd uh, who had been clawed in one eye, uh, starving to death up on a ridgeline uh, behind our house. And he'd just gone up there to die. And uh, he was starved. And uh, so I went and got him. I knew it was a bad idea. He had been astray for about a year. So he was pretty well wild. And I went up and got him. And and uh, with everyone telling me it was a bad idea. <laughs> and it was. It was a terrible idea. But, he, you know, sometimes, um, and I think people who, who, who love dogs will know what I'm talking about. Cat people won't because, you know, they have no soul. But, uh, but uh, you always need a good dog. Everybody needs a good dog. You, you don't ever not need a good dog. But sometimes in those bad, slow days, you know, those days when you kind of live in the side of river or melancholy, um, you need a bad dog. You know, you need a dog that can rip and tear at the days. And and, and that's what I have, you know. I cannot wait and, to and hear that, all about Speck. Where is Speck right now? Speck is on, Speck is technically, he is an outside dog who believes that he should get to sit on the couch. So he is either on the couch or outside. He, there is no in between. He doesn't like find a corner and lie down in it all picturesque. He either is out running the livestock, trying to herd them into some kind of stampede, or he is sitting on the couch looking at me. And, um, you know, I don't know if it's the best dog book that's ever been written but it's the best dog ever written about. He's oh, we can't best. wait. Someone has already said they're willing to buy it in advance. So she may be onto something, you may want orders now. And I guarantee you, I bet it's going to sell a lot. I think you're gonna sell a lot of copies. That's just 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 my hunch. So here's a well, question it, from, it, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was gonna say it cannot sell enough copies to make up for all the misery he has caused me. But anyway, <laughs> y'all go ahead. Uh, we're, this is gonna secure Spec's future, all right? These earnings yeah. will secure that Spec lives long, a long, long life. Right. Um, Cheryl has a question. What pushed you to begin to write? And do you have any mentors? I have about a, a, a hundred mentors, but um, what pushed me to begin was I grew up uh, at the knee of the best front porch storytellers on the face of the earth. Now, now a lot of cultures will dispute this. I think that uh, uh, people in New Orleans the stoop sitters, you know, they could argue uh, that they are. The Irish could argue that they are. Uh, obviously, the great oral historians in the Black community can dispute this. But, but I think that the people of the foothills of the Appalachians are the best storytellers on earth. The cotton mill workers and steel workers you know, the hay balers, the trot line runners. I think that they are the best talkers on the planet. They, the, the, the imagery that they can evoke in a sentence, the language that they use, which is a mix of kind of old English and hillbilly is, is you know, as is, is pretty a language as there is. So, if you grow up with those talkers who can paint you a picture and hang it on there, 
if you grow up with them, then you should be able to make a living writing. Writing is just the, the digging taters part of it. Writing is just the mechanical part of it. The telling, the showing is the best part. Mentor wise, it started with, you know, my uncle James, who, who used to wander the cemeteries. And uh, when he was in his 90s, and I asked him once, uh, Uncle Jimbo, why in the world are you staggering around the cemetery? And he winked at me and said, son, that's where the widow women are. Uh, uh, my uncles, my aunts, again, told those great stories. And then I learned that I started reading great writers. And those great writers were, um, as a boy, they were uh, Fred Gilpin, who wrote Old Yeller mm -hmm. and Savage Sam. Savage Sam, one of the great books for any age. Yeah. Um, but then I started, I read Dickens. I read Old Man in the Sea by Hemingway. Uh, I was never a huge Faulkner fan, but I yeah. saw beauty in the lines. You know, Faulkner, there was just such great beauty in the lines. Uh, um, uh, Thomas Wolfe, you know, um, so I just, you know, um, but I, I started with the Hardy Boys. I started with um, you were there, you know, you were there at the Alamo, you were there at the, I started with the boxcar children, I think of, out of Chattanooga, I think. Uh, and I, you know, so I read a little bit of everything. But McMurtry was probably the one I would most try to emulate. Everybody, I never wanted to be anybody else, but I think that they just sink into you. You know, uh, if you read Charles Frazier's Cold Mountain, that's going to sink into you. You know, if you read a great writer out of North Carolina, Ron Rash, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, his poetry about, a, uh, and I don't read many poets. You can tell by looking at me that poetry is probably not my forte. But he wrote a, a poem about cotton mill workers, wrote a series of poems called Eureka Mill. And if you read Eureka Mill all the way through, you'll be a good writer at the end of it because you cannot help but see the imagery and the detail and the color. Well, that's a good so, tip for people who are writers because, you know, it, some people I think worry if I read too much, I'll become like other people. But it sounds like, you know, maybe you connect with them because I feel like your writing is really, it does, it brings people alive. I feel like I'm sitting in the kitchen when you're talking to your mom and I, I you know, I feel like I'm there where it's happening. So description is, you know, wherever you've picked that up, it is, it is a huge part of how you tell your stories. So I'm going to transfer, I mean, transfer, <laughs> I'm going to pivot a little bit um, because yeah. what people may or may not know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to assume they do, but you were a big time journalist um, for a number of huge, big stories. Now I was a breaking news reporter on a local level, uh, but right. what right. struck me when I found this out was what you did at, for your job as a journalist, a news journalist, and what, how you write these books and they could not be more I don't want to say different, they just could not be more um, different emotions that come up. So someone has brought up one of the hardest stories, and you have said this in interviews, that this was really one that has um, stuck with you. And I, I think it's stuck with all of us who covered it. But was it, what was it like, or how emotionally hard was it to cover the Susan Smith story? That it was one of the biggies that you've, uh, you were a part of. Well, we'll start, let's start with the easy part of it. Okay. The easy part of it was that I, I have written in the same voice all the way through my writing life. Uh, when I wrote about football games in 1975, I 
try to write them with color and imagery and, and detail yeah. and, and put you people. So the leads often and the writing often in like a courtroom saga like that, you still try to capture the heart and soul of it, the, the, the mill town atmosphere you know, the, 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 the jealousies and, and want and envy that led to the death of those two little boys. Um, uh, but, but the covering of it, the writing of it, uh, we'll set that aside, but the, 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 the reporting of it, uh, would just tear you up. You know, I've written about, you know, 167, 167 people died in the Oklahoma City bombing. And I am under, I'm probably underballing that, lowballing that a little bit. But, um, but, uh, and then I covered the Pakistan uh, border with Afghanistan after 9-11. Right. And you know, wrote about militant Islamic fundamentalism and hatred and uh, on that scale. But there was something about focusing that meanness, that cruelty, that lack of feeling uh, into a tight story like the Susan Smith story. You boil it down, a mother who um, had her own uh, demons, um, uh, you know, a hard uh, childhood, uh, then married, has two children, appears to be kind of a model mother but she wants something else. She wants, uh, she wants a different life and um, sacrifices those children so she could pursue that life, pursue a, um, a man who she thought would be a, a, a doorway, a portal to a different life. Um, and And, you know, sacrificed her children to just drown them, rolled them into a lake, and then spun a web of deceit that, uh, I won't say boggled the mind, but, but uh, you know, it captured the attention of everyone. I mean, New York Times sent me down there for... <sighs> you know, to try to make sense of it. And I never did. Well, um, you said something important too, that, that, you know, just, just the fact that, that the media had to wrap their head around the idea of, oh, this could be what it was. I mean, right. I think that's one of the first cases that people, you know, it, 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 it fooled a lot of people for longer than you would think. And uh, yeah, that was a tough one. Well, the, and, yeah. Go ahead. There, there were people down there who, who were really on top of it. There were people down there who, who kind of knew. They, you know, they kind of knew. You know, they, they um, and so that when it happened, it was not a big surprise. Then there were those like me who kind of came in and out of the story. And, and, and uh, I just remember sitting in the courtroom and having the horror of it replay in that kind of sterile atmosphere of like, you know, church pews that smell like furniture polish and, and, and um, th there's something eerily awful about that, to be honest with you, but, but I've seen a lot of killing and dying, uh, written about a lot of killing and dying in my, my life, but there was something about the, the helplessness of the babies, you know, the, that, that just broke your damn heart. And yeah, uh, yeah it remains the one, um, 
quite frankly, that I, 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 I don't think a lot about it. You know, I kind of push it aside. Yeah, you kind of have to. Yeah. Um, I th I like what you said when you wrote uh, when you wrote one of your books and it centered around your mom. It, they call it they call it the story of you, uh, the, the the book you wrote. But you um you talked about how and I wonder with your experiences as you've seen such a darkness right in the world and in people. You say that you can't help but when you see that, see how bright goodness shines and how brightly people can juxtapose that can you talk just a little about that well i hope that's the way i hope that's the way it is i think that um i think that, i think that nostalgia um is more than just a sweet and filmy little emotion i think it's a power i think that people uh retreat behind it I think they, uh, and sometimes they retreat behind it and to do bad things. But, but, uh, but I think that that nostalgia, uh, our kin, our customs, our uh, the fact that we wore a Tupperware bowl on our head, you know, when we were children, you know, the fact that that. Uh, um, that banana pudding is might be a sin if you, you know, don't put it in the oven first, you know. Um, I think that that um, writing about these lighter, happier times, sometimes they're not very happy, sometimes they'll break your heart. But writing about old cemeteries and old dogs and uh, writing about uh, cars that we owned when we were 15, uh, writing about the time that your girlfriend threw your class ring across the parking lot of the Piggly Wiggly, you know, writing about being punched in the mouth for the first time and getting up. Um, writing about falling in love and uh, all these things are 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 um, are a power, you and worry? it doesn't belong to the yeah. writer. It belongs to to the people. I mean, it, it 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 feels like a power when someone reads that line and they say, "Why well, hell, I did that." You know, we did that. Well, I had that low rent SOB is stealing my story. And I think that is all a very powerful thing. An editor asked me once, what is it that keeps your readers tied to you? And, and I said, I, I think it's just the fact that they see their own lives in these stories. And, um, you know, I, I could have written, I guess, about, you know, the outbreak of democracy on a Caribbean island. You know, I covered stuff like that. Um, I could have written about the socioeconomic condition of the inner city. But the fact is, I, I don't know those things as much as I know the fact that a Southern man who doesn't have a good pocket knife in his pocket is not really a Southern man. Okay, you know, this brings me uh, to my question. Show me your pocket yeah. knife. Well, see, that would involve me to have pants. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and we are doing a I Zoom do, call, so. No, I have pants, but I am in my going to bed pants. And you're, but, but you know, a good southern man should probably carry one with him, right? or at least well, there's one a few steps away. I'll go get it. Would y'all like to hum while I'm gone? Or I'm gonna trust sing you. Song? You can't leave but, the but, screen, uh, people will be mad if you leave the screen. You can't right, leave but, the screen, but uh, <laughs> but I am in what is called transitional pants <laughs> that is when you take off your blue jeans and put on your transitional pants, which is your comfy pants. And then you transition to your jammies. So, uh, uh, so I'm in transitional pants. 
the, the, you do not need a pocket knife when you're in your transitional pants because that implies you were in the house, which means you have pocket knives close at hand. Is all okay. this clear? Okay. I, I, that is much clearer. Uh, I, I feel good now. And I love I you have, said that. Right. I have two pocket knives. One is my prized possession. Uh, well, I probably have about 40 pocket knives scattered around the place, but, but the, the I have two. One uh, is the single material possession that I own. I have a, a bone handled pocket knife made by the Bear Manufacturing Company of Jacksonville, Alabama, which is only about five miles from here. And it's a, it's a stainless steel, beautiful little work of art that my brother Sam got me. Hmm. And because he got it for me, uh, it, you know, and he sharpened it and nobody can sharpen a knife like him. The old man can sharpen a knife. And, um, uh, it is so sharp that you can cut yourself by looking at it. And uh, uh, and then I have, a, but I don't use that one every day because I'm afraid I'll lose it. You know, fr- you know, because so uh, the other one is uh, is a, a buck knife uh, made out of all steel and aluminum, and you couldn't you could beat it with a hammer and not hurt it, and it too is wickedly sharp having a pocket knife that that isn't sharp is like having glasses that you can't see through so um yeah yeah we could talk another hour and a half on the religion of pocket the religion of pocket knives i know and also um there are so many things i want to tell people who haven't read this um we're gonna do we're gonna do sort of a lightning round for you here um you're gonna give me like two sentences about these things fire ants the single worst visitation of evil that God has ever allowed to descend on humankind. Okay, Tupperware, the old Tupperware. Fried chicken on a folded clean tea towel or washcloth sweating into a lime green bowl of Tupperware may be as close as you can come to what happiness is. That's what happiness is. Original country music, current country music. Jesus, Pete on a bicycle. Uh, uh, You know, old country music, Jimmy Rogers, Hank Williams, they sang the human condition. They spread the pain of living out thin enough to where you could stand it. Modern country music is an abomination and an assault on the ears. Sung by people about riding tractors and baling hay who have never ridden a tractor or bailed any hay who, you know, I, uh, I don't need... There's just nothing good to say. Well, I don't want to put you in a bad mood. I get you. I understand. Okay. Well, you've already put me in a bad mood. Uh, (laughs) You know, it is, it is, it is cliches strung together on a string of commercial vapidness. Well, that is summed up. Okay. The metamorphosis of the pickup truck. Now I know it's a metamorphosis, but sum it up for me. Well, a pickup truck is not a pickup truck. Used to be, unless you looked in the bed and there was a curled up, rusting six foot length of logging chain. It had to be like four to six feet of logging chain uh, and nestled somewhere in the coils of that rusting link of, of chain would be an empty can of brake fluid. I don't know why no one would not like throw the brake fluid can away, but an empty can of brake fluid. Now, and and I grew up in those trucks, but you know, my truck is a, is a Toyota Tundra and it's, it's pretty, you know, it's kind of sparkly. Shiny. 
<laughs> it's shiny. It, it's shiny. And it talks to me as we go down the road. You know, if I drift a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, it, it'll it tell me. And, and, and if I, you know, if I drift a little bit too much left, right, left, right, it gives me a little message that suggests I have a cup of coffee. So, you know, that said, it's a mighty fine drug, you know, and 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 it, and it's got leather seats and 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 a, and a radio that reaches to Mars. So uh, maybe you should have taken the Zoom call from your truck. Sounds right. like it has better technology than where you're well, sitting. Well, it it does have better technology. <laughs> um, there is nothing wrong with my truck, but here's the thing: I feel a little guilty in it. You know, I feel a little bit like a uh, I feel a little bit like if I ever got out of it and started mouthing off, somebody in a real truck would pull up and just kick my ass. Yeah. Okay. This is one. Uh, uh, all full disclosure. I'm a big fly fisherman and my husband is a fishing guide. So I know that people can tell tales when fishing, but on a scale of one to 10, you as a fisherman over your lifetime. I'm not a one. I'm not a one. I'm better than a one. And, and I think I'm better than a two because, well, all right, first of all, one, let's say one is drowning. Like, you know, one is a fisherman who drowns. Uh, no pun intended. Let's say two is a fisherman who runs the hook through his thumb and has to go get it cut out at the hospital. Uh, let's say three is the one who gets sunburned so badly they have to go to the ER. I'm probably a four. I, th I think I'm a four. But see, there's no book or story to be written about a number four. So I'll cheat a little bit and say I'm more a three. And that makes for a lot better story. But no, yeah. I'm I'm a miserable fisherman. By there, the the man sitting right outside that door, my brother Sam, can feel the 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 bottom. And I don't mean feel a snag or feel a boulder, but he can bump his bait along the bottom, and and can then draw you a visual map of what that bottom looks like. I, on the other hand, if there is a, a blackberry bush to hang my bait up in, if there is a power line, a low hanging power line, um, uh, Cherokee Electric has probably cleaned more of my lures out of power lines <laughs> than fish have eaten them over the years. So no, I ain't good at it. And, I, and it's a shame too, because you know, I, I, most things that, that you think, uh, 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 I'm going to say a Southern man, but a Southerner of any stripe, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm a good shot, you know, I, now I can change my own tires. Yeah, you, you know, now, I, now wait a minute there, because you, you have talked about a perfect day for you, and again, it's called fishing, right. not catching, right, so I think you're fine, right. but you have said right. one of your perfect days would be down by the pond, you would have a fishing pole, but you brought up, you'd be a great shot. Can you paint the scenario you think would be great, including your- Oh guys? yeah, I, I think I have it planned for my retirement. <laughs> I'm gonna take a fishing rod, a, a, a lawn chair, one of the old fashioned kind with the webbing, you know, a cooler with some bologna sandwiches and some bark root beer, uh, a fishing rod, a Zebco 202, because I don't want to mess with you know, bird's nests or anything like that. Just a simple Zebco 202 with a rubber worm and a Browning 22 pistol. And I will sit there and I will put the, the and I'll take my dog, unless the dog is gun shy and then he'd have to stay at home. But instead of actually fishing, I would sit there and just shoot water moccasins. I just sit there and do absolutely nothing all day except drink root beer and shoot water moccasins. Water you moccasins feel, you have feel like, no... So if it water moccasin, fire ant, 
Which one do you mm -hmm. detest more? Well, if you step in a fire ant bed, you're going to hurt, but you probably are not going to have a heart attack and die. You, you, you had, I'll never forget it, uh, as a teenager feeling standing uh, on beside a lake, kind of a wild lake in the middle of a, of a, a wild pasture and, and, and hearing the rustle of glass and seeing a big water moccasin is as big as, as thick as my wrist slide between my feet. Oh. And I'll never forget that uh, feeling. And I froze out of probably fear, which probably kept me from getting bit. And um, so, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I think that water moccasins have even less practical purpose. You know, they eat frogs. Yeah, that's not right. I mean, you know, what did a frog ever do? I mean, I think in Australia, they like overwhelm crops, but, you know, here in Northeast Alabama, a frog is your friend. More frogs you got, more rabbits you got, the healthier your land is. So, um, so yeah, I don't like them. So I think I just, you know, I, so I would probably sit there all day and shoot them. Um, uh, I'm not a cruel person, but, but, um, uh, I just, that's just, there's just a place where the milk of human kindness resides in a person. I have none for the cotton mouth water moccasin. Well, the first, the other thing is they do come at you. They're not like other good snakes that just, you know, you agree to disagree and everyone goes their own way. All right, here's another one for you. The, and I love the way you put it, the unbridled excess of Fat Tuesday. Yeah. I love New Orleans the way some people love women. You know, I love New Orleans. And I and I love carnival, but I'm not the kind of guy, you know, I I, I, I never belong to an organization or anything, even though I live there. But I love to be a tourist, you know, when all that is going on. But you sometimes you let yourself just get a little bit too, you know, swing a little bit too far in the area of reckless abandon. And I swung a little too hard. And to now I don't talk about drinking or acting a fool. It involved the lucky dog cart. Anybody that's ever been to New Orleans knows what I'm talking about. The lucky dog is a street vendor. Uh uh, that that sells a hot dog that is uh, let's just say that it, you know it, it 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 is a little dangerous uh, because it's you know it's it's for first off it's as big around as a box of Quaker oats and uh, and you know and I got one with chili mustard and onions and and then I thought well you know it's carnival I'll have two. And that was just a real bad idea. Well, that's and, how uh, that's how people talk about the hurricanes. Drink one hurricane, yeah. don't yeah. drink the second hurricane. You'll never yeah. remember that second hurricane. All right, we're going to well, get back to writing. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, that just speaks to how dull my life is. That that you know, most people they tell a story. Boy, in New Orleans we did this, or boy, in New Orleans we did that, and you know, we was so drunk we forgot our name, and we did this, and we. You know, we went to a tattoo parlor and had a had a picture of David Hasselhoff tattooed tattooed on our posterior. You know, they say things like that about New Orleans. I just ate one too many Lucky Dogs. But, well, maybe uh, maybe you got off a, maybe you got off a little easy. You can go back. Uh, that that wasn't that that didn't ruin your reputation. I'm too old to do much in New Orleans now, except sit in the shade. But anyway, go ahead. Well, and my last thing, let's go back to we, I think we have, look, I'm looking at my clock. Gosh, we have like, what is it? 53. Okay. Um, I know that you're going to write a, a, a book involving spec. I want to know what else And this, this may be a trick question because I, I love how much you love people and tell their stories. First question is, is there anything else out there that you want to write about? Is there one thing that's still out there that you think you're ready to tackle? Well, you know, we've been threatening to do a novel for years, and, and the reason that I haven't done that is something just always came up. There was always a book that 
there was always a book that um, that I didn't want to get away. You know, I didn't want it to get away because you figure you can always write the novel in the winter of your years. You know, that's uh, you can write one or two of them. You know, before you expire. But um, I mean, there are people that I would have liked to have. Um, you know, that I would have liked to have handled their, uh, their story. Uh, but there are always, there are family quagmires, you know, uh, Hank Williams, you yeah. know, oh, if yeah. I could have written the, the real, the real uh, story of Hank Williams, uh, devoid of any, you know, outside pressure. Uh, you know, I did a, a book on Jerry Lee Lewis, yes, uh, which allowed me to write about the rock and roll, the birth of rock and roll, and the blues and country and gospel, tying all that in. But I, I think I would I would like to would have liked to have done Hank Williams. I always kind of wanted to. Um, I would have loved to have done, and I'm, I've never done uh, sports books, although I've written for Sports Illustrated and ESPN, but Bear Bryant, you know, uh, and there have been good books written about Bear Bryant, but, but again, I think of a gothic Southern story on Bryant um, would have been fun. Um, I, you know, the, what happens with me is there are things that just occur to you, you know, sometimes they just occur to you. And then sometimes your agent calls you from New York City and says, hey, you interested in doing fill in the blank? And you go, well, I never thought about that. But yeah, I think I would like to do that. So um, I'd like to, to do um, I would like to do a book someday about the last Southern man. Because well, we would like we would like to see that. So we we beg you to put that on your list and a novel. I would love that. Uh, you have you have time, and if you need me, if if your if your agent's not giving you enough pressure, I'm willing to text you every two weeks to see if you're staying on task. I will do that yeah. for your fans. I, I will take. That, I will. I will nag you. <laughs> That's the only way I get anything done. My last question for you is, you talk a lot about the, the art of storytelling and, and really your writing is storytelling. Do you worry that we are losing the art of storytelling? Number one, it takes time, it takes focus, it takes listening. What would you say about that in closing? I think we are definitely losing it and I don't think there's anything we can do about it because you can't convince young people uh, that a, a book, hardcover, that there's 500 pages about anything that's worthy of their attention. Now that is not fair to lump all those young people in to one group, that's unfair. But I do think that as a overwhelming culture, then, uh, you know, if you're going to accept a tweet as the summation of your feelings or your factual knowledge of thing, you're going to say, oh, well, they tweeted, I saw he tweeted this, so it must be true. Then I don't know how you turn that superficiality around on his head. I so just can't figure now. Yeah. So let's turn this around. Cause again, I don't want to be the one who bums you out. So let's turn it yeah. around and you are able to talk to young people because someone asked you not long ago, how, what, what is the future uh, of writing all over, but especially the South. And you say there are some young writers who are up and coming, obviously you run into some with your classes. So what would you say to the younger people when it comes to writing, when it comes to telling stories, what would you charge them with? that there are always going to be readers, that there are always going to be readers. There are always going to be people who 
take the time to uh, absorb a good story. They're always going to be there. I think that that the, the that number, and maybe uh, and and maybe I'm being really pessimistic because uh, editors tell me that that you know there's there's a real hunger right now for good books and good stories, and I certainly believe that. I guess I'm I think that that the longer form story books are always going to have. Uh, Read, there are always going to be people that are going to hunger for them, but but I guess what I'm getting at would be more. It used to be, and I know I sound like Methuselah, but it used to be you tucked a newspaper under your arm and you sat down at a table and you had a sandwich or went to a meet and three and you read about what was happening in Beirut and you read about what was happening at the school board. You know, you might not have been vitally interested in what happened at the school board, but it was presented to you in a way by smart people who said, hey, maybe you need to know a little bit more about this. And then you turn the sports page and you find out the story behind the story, not just a score or a, or what defense somebody is running, but where this player's mom and daddy, which mill they worked at, you know. And then you went to the, the feature page and you had these good reads about music, about where you could go cut down a good Christmas tree. You know, and and now it's two lines, four lines. I don't tweet. I am six foot two. I weigh two hundred and seventy pounds. I'm trying to cut down to about two forty. A man six foot two, two seventy should not tweet. I mean, think about it. Ask that man, six foot two, two seven, what'd you do today? I tweeted, well, y'all just slap him. Y'all just haul off and just slap him. You know, I've been tweeting. You just ought to just haul off and just punch him in the face. And I bet uh, he doesn't have a pocket knife. That have po Betty rides around in a car. It doesn't have a jack in the trunk or a spare. <laughs> You thank know. you so much for your time. I, we could go on and on. I I, I can't even thank you enough. I, I know how excited people are uh, to see you and hear from you. Um, I asked you before we started, you're not sure when you're going to be able to get out there in person, but you do want to. You're not off the circuit. No, I'll be back next year, next fall, if a vaccine and, uh, and the good Lord willing. Uh, uh, we'll be back next fall and, and see all the people that we should have seen this fall. But thank y'all. This was fun and easy. I appreciate oh, it was, it was, it was our pleasure. Thank you so much. Again, thank you to the friends of the library, Diane Robinson of Eagle Eye Books. You want to make sure you try to get a book. She's got a few left and we've got a nameplate to go with it. He has signed nameplates to put in your book and also Abigail Endler of Penguin Random House um, and Rick, really, I appreciate your time. Get back to your family. Hug your mom from us. And I know you say you want to cut down, but for goodness sake, do not stop eating the banana pudding. That's what oh, you don't do. Worry, you got to have it running through your that, veins. Yeah, that's not going to happen. But but uh, uh, thank y'all. This was fun. We'll do it again. Let's do it. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for everyone for joining us. We appreciate you. And we'll see you next time. Gwinnett. County, Public Library, Books Matter, The Power of Books. Let's all keep reading.